it is Friday, and here at Crepuscular Academy, the work of the week is done. The classrooms are dark and empty and mostly silent. The more dangerous textbooks have been locked away, so why don't you join us in my study as we delve once more into Dr. Longshadow's miscellany of the uncanny. Good evening. My name is Dr. James Archipelago Longshadow, and it is my immense privilege to be the head teacher of Crepuscular Academy, an educational establishment whose curriculum is somewhat more adventurous than that of other schools. However, I am not here to proffer the prospectus. Rather, I find myself in the delightful position of being able to offer you an invitation. It has long been a custom of mine that, come Friday evening when the work of the week is done, my students are invited to join me in my study, where they are welcome to enjoy a comfortable chair, a steaming cup of hot chocolate, a roaring fire, and, of course, a story. Indeed, this little soiree has become such a tradition here at the Academy that it has acquired its own title amongst the students, that of Dr. Longshadow's Miscellany of the Uncanny. Recently, it was suggested that we should record our Friday night get-togethers in order that those not fortunate enough to attend dear old Crepuscula in person might be able to enjoy these tales in the comforts of their own home. And so, here we are. And there you are. So please, find somewhere comfortable to sit. Perhaps make yourself a hot chocolate and indulge in this week's biscuit of choice, which I believe is the, uh, yes, the custard cream. And join us for this week's tale. The main topic of conversation amongst the residents of Blossom Lane all summer long had been the building work that was being carried out at the place they all referred to as the Old Factory. The great brick building had earned its name by merit of being both old, Victorian in fact, and a factory. It had been derelict for many, many years, and nobody living could say with certainty what it had been built for. There was, however, a general belief mainly fueled by playground tales that whatever large machines had been housed within its austere walls had been responsible for the untimely demise of many a poor workhouse child. Depending on the preference of the storyteller, these poor Victorian mites have been variously crushed, minced, or stuck up chimneys and left to waste away to wraiths. Whatever its original purpose, the old factory was now the haunt of pigeons, less fortunate members of the community seeking some shelter, and the occasional teenager hoping to find everlasting internet fame by filming themselves performing a death-defying stunt. They may well have defied death, but they seldom defied the hospital and or the police. At the start of summer, workers in orange hard hats have been seen busying themselves around the factory, erecting tall barricades before swarming inside and shutting the gates behind them. The local children, showing a remarkable lack of imagination by deciding that there was nothing better to do with six weeks off school holidays, had tried repeatedly to find out what was going on inside. However, these junior detectives were to be frustrated in their attempts by the incredibly tall and unwieldy barricades. By day, banging, clanging, drilling, and other various machine-type noises could be heard from within. At night, huge floodlights burned brightly and busy shadows danced against the walls in a most intriguing way. Two children, let's call them Peter and Jane, were particularly keen to find out what was going on in the old factory. They lived next door to each other, and their houses sat directly across the street from the rusted gates. They had been friends for as long as they could remember. Now by most, Jane was considered to be naughty, whereas Peter was seen as something of a golden child, an example of lovely manners and good behaviour. 
This summary of their characters was not entirely accurate. However, Peter was able to benefit from being constantly compared to his friend, so that, with very little effort on his part, he was often seen, usually by his relieved parents, as a paragon of virtue. It wasn't that Jane was evil or wicked, she just appreciated the lighter side of life. After all, what lesson wasn't enlivened by a loud pretend farting noise, a drawing pin left on the teacher's chair, or even a false fire alarm? Hilarious. Classics. And if the price to be paid was that her poor mother was frequently called to the school for a discussion with Jane's teachers, and if she then marched home to have a discussion with Jane, then so be it. It was worth it for that glorious moment of chaos when the children cheered her on and fell about laughing. It was Peter who first noticed something strange about the work in the old factory. At first he wasn't sure, but after a few days and nights of watching closely from his bedroom window, he became quite certain. No one ever goes in or comes out, he told Jane the next day. They were lying on the grass in Jane's garden, recovering from a particularly eventful game of murder ball. This was a game of Jane's devising, which was exactly the same as football, but with all the pesky rules gleefully ignored. Who doesn't go in or come out of where? said Jane, as she carefully checked a tooth that may well have become loosened in the match. The factory, said Peter. No one goes in or comes out. You sure? Jane said. Yeah. I stayed up all night last night watching. They just kept working, banging and, and sawing and stuff, but no one went in or came out. So, the tooth, it turned out, was not loose, and this disappointed her. I don't know, it's, it's just a bit well, weird, Peter said, finding it difficult to articulate the feeling of unease that he felt whenever he looked at the old factory. In truth, he had found it quite easy to stay up watching the building site, as lately he had had trouble sleeping. You know what we should do? Jane said brightly. What? She smiled. It was a special smile, a long, slow, curling, pleased with itself smile that Peter recognized very well. It was the smile that she wore when she'd come up with a really, really good idea. We should sneak in tonight and take a look. Peter may have been seen as the good one by people who knew the two children, but he shared Jane's love of adventure and fun. It was simply the case that he, like many people, lacked the courage to act on his wilder urges and ideas. So he was more than happy to be inspired by, and go along with, any ideas that his bolder friend might think up for both of them. Being summer, the line between day and night was warm and blurry. The sky would be blue and then purple long before it turned black, and children were expected to be back inside and safely tucked in. And so it was that Jane and Peter were walking along the fence at the rear of the factory where it backed onto the canal, just as most people were settling down for the evening. They walked along the worryingly narrow strip of grassy wasteland between the barrier and the canal, whistling and throwing whatever objects it could find into the water, each trying to outsplash the other. Peter had some vague notion that this mission should at some point involve some manner of stealth. However, he took his lead from Jane, who seemed to think that their noisy progress was acceptable. The fence was solid and offered no way to peek at what lay beyond, let alone sneak through to the other side. However, Jane suddenly stopped, almost knocking Peter into the deep, deep black water, and pointed. Look, she said. Peter indeed looked and saw that something had burrowed beneath the barrier. For a moment he wondered what might have dragged itself out of the water to dig its way through here, but decided quickly to stop wondering that. We'll never get through there, he said. We can dig it out a bit, make it bigger, come on. And so, after a little light excavating, the children stood, dirty but proud, looking down at a gap beneath the barrier, just big enough. Naturally, Jane went first. They squiggled and squirmed and wormed their way through and out to the other side. Both of them stood, dusted themselves off, and looked around. They gasped as they realized with dawning horror just what it was that had taken shape behind the barriers over the last weeks. 
Jane was about to say something when they felt strong hands grab their shoulders. A school, Jane's mother said. It had been nearly an hour since Peter and Jane had been escorted out of the building site and back to their houses by a large man in a black suit and an orange tie. He had dropped Peter off first, where his parents had apologized and assumed that it had all been that Jane's fault. And now the man in the black suit was sitting in Jane's living room, talking to her mother. Well, I suppose you could call it a school, the man said. His name was Mr. Beswick, and he explained that he was one of the teachers of a new establishment. But we prefer to think of it as an educational greenhouse, an environment for growing and developing those with exceptional intellectual promise. Sounds like school to me, said Jane's father from the kitchen. Jane's father did not like people and tended to stay out of the way if there was a visitor. And, and you want Jane to go to this school? said her mother. We would love her to come. Jane is just the kind of child we're looking for. We believe she'd thrive with us. You you do mean Jane, don't you? you? You're not getting her mixed up with Peter from next door? Mrs. Bennington, Jane shows exactly the kind of spirit and initiative that we value. Oh, that's one way of putting it, muttered Jane's father darkly from the kitchen. Well, Jane's mother lowered her voice. How much would it cost? Well, that's the best part. We would be happy to offer Jane a free place. Free? Oh, well, in that case... Summer ended, and the grey September days of school beckoned. As if on cue, the weather broke, and on the first day of school, clouds gathered above Blossom Lane. Peter had had a week to get used to the idea that he wouldn't have Jane with him in school that year. And yes, he was going to miss her. But actually, he was more jealous about the fact that she had been chosen to go to a swish new school while he was stuck in the same tired old place with the same tired old teachers. Although it should be noted that since finding out that Jane would not be returning to Gaslight Primary, the teachers had, for once, been looking forward to returning, and indeed had a definite spring in their collective step. Peter had made sure that he was out and ready in time to see Jane going into her new school. She looked very smart as she stepped out of her house. Her black blazer and orange skirt were clean and pressed with razor-sharp edges. Her hair, which had run free and wild all summer, had been wrestled into tight bunches. Her face was pink and scrubbed. She looked a miserable. I don't want to go, she wailed to her mother, who stood proudly at the door. Oh, don't be silly, Jane. It's just across the road. It's exciting. And remember, they chose you. Yeah, Jane, said Peter from his garden. You've been chosen. You look really smart. Jane shot him a dark look that would normally have sent him running. However, he felt emboldened with her mother standing there watching them. He knew he was being spiteful, teasing her, goading her, but he was sad, and he was a boy. Mother or not, Jane was giving serious consideration to scooping up some mud from her front garden and throwing it at Peter, and just then a sound from across the road stopped her in her tracks. It was a bell. Now, the bell at Peter's school was more like an industrial drill going off in your skull. It buzzed angrily to tell them when to go in and when to get out. The peals that drifted across Blossom Lane that morning were altogether different. They lilted and floated delightfully, echoing along the road. The children looked over and saw a large woman standing at the gates of a new school ringing a handbell. Come on, my little grubs, she called. Time to start being good little workers. Now, normally, this would have been enough to send Peter and Jane into bladder-loosening convulsions of laughter. But there was something about this woman that made the words seem completely reasonable and in no way ridiculous. Peter watched as Jane walked out of her garden and towards the school. He noticed she was smiling. He trotted after her, curious to see who this woman was. As Jane got nearer, the woman beamed. Ah, you would be Jane, am I right? Yes, miss. Yes, miss, 
Yes, miss. Peter had never known Jane sound so, well, so normal. Usually she would greet a teacher with a sarcastic, Yo! He had never, ever heard her say, Yes, miss. He was, quite frankly, appalled. Well, Jane, said the smiling woman, I am Miss Conigan, and I am the head teacher. Peter couldn't help but notice how plump and jolly Miss Conigan looked. Many head teachers these days are gaunt things, made riff thin through paperwork and government visits. Miss Conigan, however, looked like she had never worried about a thing in her life. She took Jane's hand and led her through the gates. Say goodbye to your little friend, dear. Goodbye. With that, she was swallowed by the new school, and the gates clanged shut. Peter trudged through the day as best he could. He found that without Jane to liven things up, school was almost unbearably dull. The spark had gone. Come 3.15, he was one of the first out of the door and running down the street as fast as his feet could carry him. He was halfway down Blossom Lane when he saw Jane. She was in a crowd of children who were walking calmly, not running, out of the gates of a new school. The happy head teacher, Miss Conigan, was standing there, waving them off. Goodbye, grubs. I shall see you all tomorrow, my good little workers. Peter caught up with Jane as she was about to walk up her path. Hey, he shouted. What's up with her? Jane blinked at Peter, smiling. What is up with whom, Peter? Your fat head teacher. She called you old grubs. Peter, that is a very rude thing to say. Miss Conigan is lovely. Good night. Don't you want to do something? I am doing something, Peter. Miss Conigan has given us a fascinating homework on the cross-pollination of certain types of flora. And with that, she was gone, disappearing into her house and leaving Peter open-mouthed with astonishment and horror. Surely this couldn't be his friend, his Jane. The cause of many a teacher choosing early retirement, Jane, the architect of such acts of fabulous mischief and mayhem that they would have made all the imps in hell jealous. Surely not. And yet, over the next few days, the evidence stacked up. There was Jane sitting in her garden, studying flowers with a magnifying glass. There was Jane walking to school, looking scrubbed and spick and span each day, in times past, she would have managed a level of scruffy in hours that would have taken other children at least two weeks. There was Jane hugging, actually hugging her hair teacher. And each night, when most right-thinking children were sitting down to stare at a television or mobile screen for a few hours, there was Jane trotting over to her school for extra lessons. It was about this time that the community was gripped by a crime wave. Summer had been kind to the gardeners of the area, and there had been an overabundance of flowers on display that year. However, over the last few nights, from every garden and every greenhouse, from every window box and hanging basket, flowers had been taken. Not the whole plant, mind you, oh no. Whoever had been carrying out this nefarious midnight pruning had done so neatly, almost surgically beheading the poor things and leaving nothing but lonely stalks behind. This was, understandably, a cause for concern to the locals as, without the dressing of flowers, the town, which was little more than a latticework of narrow industrial streets peppered with abandoned factories and shops, would be revealed in all its post-industrial grey glory. Whilst Peter was aware of the floral felony afoot, it was of no consequence to him. He was far more concerned with the change that seemed to have overtaken his friend. The final straw came when Peter's mother said something earth-shatteringly, universe-shakingly awful to him. Seven words he never, ever thought he would have heard. Why can't you be more like Jane? That was the moment when Peter's despair at the change in his friend became suspicion. And that was the issue, wasn't it? Jane wasn't like Jane. Not any more. Something had happened to her. They had done something to her. It was the only logical explanation. 
An adult might have suggested that perhaps Jane had decided to stop clowning around, knuckle down and start working hard to ensure a good education and therefore a prosperous future as a useful member of society. But Peter knew better. In his bones he knew something was terribly wrong. And so it was that late one night, when he had watched Jane cross the road carefully, looking both ways for goodness sake, and pass through her school gates, that he slipped out of his house. There was no way he would be able to get into the school through the front entrance, and so he made his way around the back of the building, along the very same path beside the canal that he and Jane had used only weeks ago. It was getting darker earlier now, and the sun was on the other side of the building. The canal was a black, rippling ribbon that burbled and gurgled next to him. He took his time, wary of slipping and falling into the treacly waters, trying not to listen to his treacherous brain as it whispered to him about how he'd never be found. Eventually, after what felt like far too long, he found the gap under the fence where the two friends had once snuck in. To his surprise, it had not been filled in, and he found it quite easy to squeeze his way through. Once he was on the other side, he stood, dusted himself off, and looked around. He was surprised to see that the rear of the school, the side away from the public gaze, was still a building site. Nothing had changed since the day he and Jane had first come here. Piles of rubble and bricks were scattered everywhere, there was even a wheelbarrow lying on its side like an abandoned pram. He had expected a state-of-the-art playground, not this. Now Peter was sure that all was not as it seemed. He crept across the space and headed for the shelter of the wall. To be honest, he didn't know where to go. This was as far as his brilliant plan had got. It was then that he heard the sound. It was quiet at first, but the more he listened, the more obvious it became. It was a low sound, and after straining to hear, he realized it was a droning voice, buzzing away from somewhere within the building. Peter followed the sound and located the partially open window that the faint noise was drifting through. It was louder here, and he began to make out words. He pushed up the window and took a deep breath. Jane, the old Jane, wouldn't have hesitated to jump up and climb in. And it was for her sake, for the sake of the friend that he had lost, that Peter scrambled his feet against the wall and huffed his way up. He hooked his elbows over the sill and with a big effort boosted himself up and in. He had expected the school to be new and shiny, the rooms to be glistening white like the inside of a spaceship or a showroom for the latest however did we live without them devices. Instead, the small room he found himself in was more like the inside of a cave. The floor was rough, and after he'd stood up and nervously reached out to steady himself, he discovered the walls were bumpy. They felt strange, not like plaster, more like he struggled to think what they did remind him of, and then it came to him. The walls felt waxy, like they had been made of melted candles. Peter crept from this room and entered a tunnel. There was no other way to describe it. A tunnel made from the same substance that he had encountered in the room. There was just enough space for an adult to walk along upright, but no more than that. Every cell in the poor boy's body was screaming at him to turn around, to get out, but the thought of his friend kept him going through the tunnels that twisted and turned, split and detoured into a maze. Onwards he plunged in this labyrinth, following the noise. He had no real plan other than to rescue Jane. How he was going to accomplish this was a detail that he hadn't quite thought through yet. Perhaps he was hoping that some of Jane's devil-may-care genius had rubbed off on him, and he would be struck with inspiration when the moment arrived. Eventually, the tunnel came to an end, and Peter found himself standing at the edge of a hall. He guessed that this had once been the main area of the factory. As he crouched in the shadows, he saw the same waxy substance plastered on the floors, the walls, and even covered the high ceiling. 
Filling most of the space were rows of long tables, and sitting at the tables, smiling, calmly, silently, were children. In all, there must have been about a hundred little faces, all turned towards the other end of the room where Miss Kernigan stood, grinning broadly. And now, my good little workers, her voice echoed around the hall, after your splendid harvest, now you can fulfill your roles. She clapped her hands and a procession of men entered the room. They were all wearing the same black suits and orange ties that the teacher who had captured the two friends the first time they had trespassed had been wearing. The men all carried a large bow, which they ferried to each of the long tables and placed in front of every child. It was then that Peter saw Jane. She was sitting at the end of one of the tables and had just had a bow placed in front of her. She was smiling, almost as much as her head teacher, and as she reached down into the bowl, she licked her lips. With two hands, she scooped something up, and Peter realized what it was. Flowers. Somewhere in the back of his mind, I am sure that he made the connection to the recent horticultural crime wave. However, he was so taken aback by what had happened next that his poor brain had no choice but to suspend all other activities so that he could process what was going on. Begin, shouted Miss Conigan. At this command, all the children began eating the flowers. There was nothing dainty in the way that they ate. They didn't nibble on the petals like fairies at a forest feast far from it. They guzzled and chomped and chewed and gnashed their way through the contents. Some had even buried their faces in the bowls the better to devour this unusual meal. Jane attacked her bowl of flowers with as much gusto as anyone else there. Peter watched in utter disbelief as her jaws worked furiously, machine-like. First a fistful of daffodils, then some roses, followed by a handful of carnations, all were scooped up and polished off in a fury. Peter had seen his fill. He knew enough to understand that this was nothing he could handle on his own. He was just about to run off and fetch help when he realized that the children had finished eating. He felt the atmosphere change in the hall. Something else was going to happen. Something worse. He had to stay. The children stood up behind their bowls, and he could see their throats beginning to ripple. Jane had a long string of drool hanging from one corner of her mouth. Of course, Peter thought, they're going to be sick. He wasn't surprised. He was no horticulturalist, but even he knew that most of the flowers they had eaten were not suitable for human consumption. And he didn't have to wait too long. Jane and all the other enthusiastic diners began throwing up. Peter's eyes were locked on the horror that unfolded. Even if he had wanted to run, he could not have. With dreadful sounds of retching, each child filled their bowl with thick, viscous vomit. Tears ran down their faces, but bizarrely, Peter could see that they were all smiling. At last, they were finished, and collapsed exhausted into their seats. It was then that the men in black suits came and took the bowls from the tables, they fetched them with great solemnity over to a large barrel that sat in front of Miss Conigan. They then proceeded to tip the noxious contents of the bowls into this barrel. Peter couldn't help but notice how thick the vomit was. He saw it coil and loop into the barrel, like the kind of ice cream one gets from the vans at seasides, or the kind of syrup that some people drizzle over their food, or... or... And then Peter realized what it reminded him of most. Honey. From somewhere in last year's science lessons, he recalled the gloriously grim moment he had discovered how bees actually made honey. He hadn't eaten it since. The children, red-eyed from their efforts, were watching attentively as Miss Conigan reached out her little finger and scooped up a bead of the foul liquid. She closed her eyes as she licked the amber droplet with the tip of a long, thin, black tongue. Delicious, she smiled. More than enough for winter. 
It was surprising that after all he had seen and heard, it was this small gesture that finally made Peter feel nauseated enough to be sick himself. He tried to contain it, but couldn't. And at the sound of his own wretched heaving, the collected heads in the hall snapped round and stared at him. Without a word, they stood and began walking towards him. Of course, he ran. To his credit, he found his way through the tunnels unerringly. The human body in flight is capable of many great feats in its efforts to survive. Peter dodged and weaved his way through the glistening tunnels as fast as his panic-stricken legs would carry him. Behind him, the drone of angry voices carried through the narrow passages, spurring him on. He almost made it. As he stumbled into the room where he had made his entrance not so long ago, he saw the window still open. With relief, he darted for it, allowing himself to think that he might just get away, that he might just... A man in a black suit and an orange tie stepped between him and the window, blocking the moonlight that now glowed in the sky. Peter stood, open-mouthed, as the man began to unscrew his left hand. It made an ugly, plastic sound as it clattered to the floor. The last thing poor Peter saw was a long, barbed black spike unfolding from the end of the man's sleeve, a drop of liquid hanging on the point, catching the light. He didn't even have time to scream. Peter's disappearance, whilst upsetting for his parents, somewhat faded into the background compared to the vanishing of a whole school's worth of children and staff. Concerned parents had alerted the police, who had arrived at the building to find... Nothing. No teachers, no children, no books, no records, nothing. Similarly, Peter was never found. Well, now my tale, as they say, is at an end. It is high time that my students made their way back to their rooms, so as I bid them good night, let me take this opportunity to thank you for joining us here at Crepuscular Academy and to invite you to join us again next week for another story from Dr. Longshadow's Miscellany of the Uncanny. Until then, good night. <laughs>